for give or take a year. We've done about 115, 120 so uh, uh, virtual events with all kinds of great authors. And it's been wonderful staying connected with all of you and, and also connecting with new people. You know, I hope if you're watching from another state uh, or even another country, welcome. It's great to have you virtually here with us at Magic City Books. We're a nonprofit bookstore located in downtown Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, um, you know, we've been doing, gosh, over, usually over 100 or so in-person author events up till this past year and looking really forward to at some point getting back into that space. So uh, hopefully this summer into the fall, we'll kind of start creeping back into that norm, normal space, whatever that is. A um, lot of great stuff coming up. I hope you'll go to our website, magiccitybooks.com. I won't go through the whole list. We literally have dozens and dozens of these uh, over the next few months. And uh, I would encourage you to just check it out and see and see what's coming. I think if, no matter what you're interested in, there's usually something every month or so at least for everybody. So check that out. Couldn't be more thrilled about tonight's event. Uh, I've been a fan of Mark Kurlansky's work for a long, long time. And, and, and I was thinking about his work and if you've read his work, um, I, it, it seems to me um, I don't want to embarrass him, but it feels like he kind of defined and owned a genre of books that seems so commonplace now, which is the taking the one thing, the deep dive into something you think you may know something about, and kind of turning it into a book about everything, right? If you talk about cod, or we talk about salt, or any of these wonderful books that Mark has written over the years, you know, um, I always say like people ask me about my favorite movies or my favorite books and my favorite and they'll say what's that about the ones that I love the most, the true answer is they're about everything right They're they use a device or they talk about something that's an entry point. Uh, but they really are talking about life, humanity, all these different big topics, but you have to find that thing and, and, and Mark, I think has. Uh, is a true master at doing that and tonight uh, we're going to be doing something quite similar through the lens of fly fishing uh, for his wonderful new book, The Unreasonable Virtue of Fly Fishing, which is just out from Bloomsbury. Um, I know nothing about fly fishing. I knew nothing about it before I read this book. I knew nothing about it when I read, you know, uh, a, a, a River Runs Through It years ago. The best thing for me is not knowing anything about what I read. I think a lot of people think you only want to uh, read about things you love or things you know. One of the great things for me about reading and books in general is going into places I have no idea about and learning new things going. It's traveling. We've obviously not been able to travel much this year and getting to kind of go with Mark on these journeys and imagine hearing that water running and not to mention the frustrations and joys that he talks about in this book. It, it, what was a truly joyful experience for me. Um, so given the I'm not a uh, expert in this and, and uh, I wanted to bring someone who is in. I reached out to my friend Jake Miller, who is the owner of Heirloom Rustic Ales, a uh, wonderful brewery here in town in Tulsa, but also someone who I know as a passionate, passionate fisherman and fly fisher. And, uh, I, 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 and I will say about Jake too is he's one of these things that I love, which is someone who's both a very outdoorsy kind of dude, but also super literary. We can talk as much about books as we can about, you know, the more uh, uh, the more masculine pursuits, we should say. Um, but it's always great to, to get to hang with Jake and Jake's gonna moderate tonight. If you have a question, I'm sure you'll have many, please be putting those into the Q&A here and then we'll prep pull some of those while the conversation is happening. Most importantly, you need a copy of this book. If you guys have ever seen the Oklahoma bestseller list, we have a goal for tonight. We want the unreasonable virtue of fly fishing to be on that next edition of the Oklahoma bestsellers nonfiction list. And we need you guys out there watching to make that happen. It's very easy to do. You go into the chat function here. We're gonna put an easy link for you to buy a copy of this book. You click that link, you buy the book and you've done your part. If you wanna buy more than one for your friends or your family, or if you just wanna read it more than once, you can actually click it several times. Um, so do that. Let's do that for Mark for spending some time with us. Couldn't be more thrilled. Welcome, Mark Kurlansky. Thank you, Jake, for doing this. I'll turn it over to you as moderator and let's get this conversation going. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jeff. Uh, and yeah, I guess we'll dive right into it. Mark, uh, before we get to some of the fishing stuff, I actually just wanted to kind of pick your brain uh, because like Jeff, I've also read a lot of your work and 
I just, I wanted to know about your research, like how you go about researching. Do you have a team? Uh, you clearly have plenty of books. Uh, I see that. Um, <laughs> just what it looks like for you when you're taking down these enormous topics. Yeah, I, um, I mean, this book is a little different because it, it, it is all that, you know, and it's the history and everything, but it also has a, a kind of a memoirish it has a personal side to it, which I don't usually do. And I was sort of interested in seeing if I could fuse those two things together. But um, normally, I say I, I read an enormous amount of books. And uh, I try to go to a lot of places and talk to a lot of people. Um, I did all the research for this book. Uh, before the pandemic, so I was able to, so I was able to do it. I, I, um, I don't know. Yeah. I just try to learn everything I can about a subject, and and I have a an almost neurotic fear that I'll miss something. Um, so I just keep digging and digging and digging, and then. You know, you, you reach a point where you just keep coming up with the same answers over and over again, and then you think, well, I guess we're here. Is that usually when you start writing, when you feel like you've researched a, a thing to uh, where you don't have any questions about it anymore? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Ideally, How I mean, ideally, you should know, when you write a book, you should know more about that subject than you could ever possibly get into the book. If you're, if you're putting everything you know into the book, you don't know enough. Well, and then, so in your book, you even go through kind of the history and the development of rods and reels and flies, and it's exhaustive. And lines. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, you know, you're covering a large part of human history. <laughs> in that and so yeah more than you would think more than you would think you know uh you know the ancient romans were fly fishermen the ancient chinese were fly fishermen and and uh, you know they left descriptions of this fishing and it sounds very familiar to us even even their descriptions of some of the flies they tied sound like something that we could see tying today Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think uh, I was fascinated by, you never think of ancients doing fly fishing because we yeah, always... You think, you, you, you think of ancient people, you know, life was hard and they were sort of pragmatic and they had to get food and all that. <clears throat> but it's not true. They had leisure time and, um, you know, nobody who isn't crazy would fly fish to get food. You know? So anybody who's fly fishing has enough to eat. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's interesting to see these ancient people um, just having fun fishing, not about gathering food at all. Yeah, I usually tell people when they ask me about fly fishing, you know, a lot of them are have used gear of some sort or fished in, you know, neighborhood ponds or something like that. And they always ask me to kind of describe fly fishing. And I usually start with just, it's the best way to catch 90% less fish than you're used to. Yeah. But that's the, <clears throat> that's the thing. You are so unlikely to catch a fish that it's a great moment when you do. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. That's why I call the book the uh, unreasonable virtue. <laughs> that makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. The I've definitely been on rivers or in situations before where you know I've come home with two fish, you know, and but it felt you know like I did more than any twenty five or thirty fish day ever. Yeah, I mean a great fly fishing day is one in which you're casting all day and catching nothing. And when you say, okay, I'm only gonna do three more casts and you get a hit, <laughs> you, know, you get that one fish, that's a great day. I agree, I agree. Uh, was it easier for you to uh, 
to write a book about something that you're intimately associated with or was it harder? Um, well, in some ways it was harder. You know what it did? It, it, it forced me to ask myself the question that I'd never asked before, why do I fish? I've been fishing all my life, long before I learned about fly fishing, you know, starting as a little kid with a branch and a string and a hook and a worm. Um, I've just been, for as long as I can remember, if there was any kind of a body of water, I would look at it and try to figure out what the bottom was like and what the flow was and what the, what the insects were doing and what the birds were doing and what was in there and, and how I could catch it. And why? I'm, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure because, you know, some people don't feel that way at all. Um, a, a friend of mine who's a book editor recently did a, uh, a book that involved fishing and he said, you know, since I've read that book, I, when I look at a body of water, I, I think about what fish are under there. I said, really? I've always thought about that. That's, that's what I do when I see any body of water. Um, so something that happens really early on in life too. I'm not sure if that was the case for you, but yeah, I, I, mean, was, I, I was a little kid, you know, and I, I just, I was catching these little sunfish that my mother refused to cook, you know, <laughs> bring home the catch and she'd say, Oh, get rid of that stuff. But, you know, I don't know. Why? Because I don't come from a fishing family. Nobody else in my family. Uh, when I went out fishing, I have a twin brother. And my twin brother and I would go out with, you know, branches and strings and, and catch fish. But nobody else in the family ever fished. My father never fished. My father was a totally urban person from Boston. And, uh, you know, his idea of the outdoors was, you know, 15 minutes outside or, you know, I remember uh, I take out, I always love to go to the sea, you know, to go to the beach and I, I'd take my grandfather and he'd wear a suit and tie and a hat. <laughs> and he'd sort of sit there on the blanket like he was going to the bank or something. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, it, it seems to be kind of this organic thing that just really overwhelms certain people. And, uh, and you kind of hit on that in your book about there's just people that step into water. I, I, think, I, think, I think it's fundamentally a desire to feel a part of nature, to participate. Um, you know, hunting is the same thing. I've done very little hunting because I'm not cut out for it. I feel bad. <laughs> I, I don't know. I can kill fish, but I feel bad when I kill mammals. So I don't do it much. But um, I, I know that, you know, if you're stalking deer or elk, it's, it's not that different from, from fly fishing in a way. You know, you're studying the terrain and you're studying the animal and you're trying to figure out what the animal is thinking. Yeah, it's interesting that fly fishing is one of the only uh, types of fishing where you'll see someone just sit there and watch water for sometimes, you know, 20, 30 minutes before they really make a decision about what to do next. Yeah, although I've done that with other kinds of fishing, too. I, I, I grew up surf casting, which is what, that's what you do in New England if you don't own a boat, you know. Uh, <laughs> You, know, you surf cast for stripers and blues. And um, it, it's in some ways the same kind of thing. You know, you look out at the ocean, you see what the birds are doing and you try to, you try to figure out, you have to first of all, figure out where the fish are. And then you have to figure out how they're swimming, how you can make this plug um, look like the things they're eating. Um, so it's, you know, a lot of fishing is like that, but with fly fishing more than anything, you know, fly fishing is this great puzzle. You know, you go to this spot in the river and it looks good because I don't know, there's a, there's a pool, there's a still trough by a fast running stream, there's some bugs hatching over it. Uh, 
you know, I don't know, for a variety of reasons, you think this is the spot. And then you have to figure it out. It's a, you know, it's a puzzle. You have to figure out, do you want to fish out of the sunlight or out of the shade? Uh, you know, what kind of fly do you want to use? Uh, do you, uh, you, you, is this a dry fly situation or a wet fly situation or, you know, just tons of things that you have to figure out. Um, what color fly? Uh, some people think that fish don't care what color fly you use. I'm not sure they do. I think they do care though, whether you use a light one or a dark one. I, I, I was fishing in this river called the Ozunaya, which is in the Kamchatka, which is a remote peninsula in Pacific Russia. that's just loaded with fish. And so much so that, you know, if you're casting for 20 minutes and you don't have a fish, you're doing something wrong. So, you know, I cast for 20 minutes. If I wasn't getting anything, I'd say, well, uh, maybe the fly's too light. I'll try a dark fly. And, you know, that's all I did for the week I was there is, is, is you know, switch between dark flies and light flies. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you just have all these situations. And, and of course, if it's not a river like that, if it's a river where really, they're really making you work for it, then you really have all kinds of decisions to make. Right. Uh, we actually uh, have a question from somebody on Facebook that wants to know if you have a favorite place to fish. Many favorite places to fish. I actually, in the book, I did drawings. I did uh, charcoal and graphite and ink drawings of 12 of my favorite rivers. Um, I, uh, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of like dogs, you know. When, it, when, I, when I see a dog, I always say, oh, that's a nice dog. And one day somebody said to me, that's what you say every time you see a dog. <laughs> and I'm kind of like that with rivers too, if they're, you know, if they're beautiful and, uh, you know, they have uh, an interesting situation. Uh, I, I love them. I fish, I fish a lot in Idaho. Um, uh, I fish uh, sometimes in New England. You'd think I'd fish more in New England because it's close by, but uh, for some reason I don't. Uh, but I do sometimes. Um, I, uh, I love fishing in Ireland. Um, that's kind of because I just like hanging out with Irish people, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but beautiful rivers. Uh, Atlantic salmon, which is the as far as I'm concerned, that's the fish. Um, uh, very hard to, very hard to catch. Um, There's a, I think I heard you talking somewhere else and I think I might get the number wrong, but I think you said something along the lines of there's only 750,000 Atlantic salmon left. Is that right? About a million and a half. It's about a million, a million. and a half. But that's, you know, if you just think of how many million uh, Pacific sockeye run in Bristol Bay every July, um, you know, you get an idea of how reduced Atlantic salmon are. It's, it's really frightening. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what, what are some of the... Uh, your book, Salmon, by the way, is fantastic. Uh, Thank you. I, I ripped through that book in, I think, 48 hours and couldn't put it down. Um, you talk a little bit about some of that, but I, w I wonder if you uh, might want to talk about why, uh, why Atlantic salmon, even though we're not commercially fishing for them anymore, still yeah. are coming. Wrong. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that, that's the thing, you know, and in about 90, 1997 or something, I came out with my book on cod. <clears throat> and that was at a time when the, the uh, northern stock of codfish, one of the most famous fish stocks in history, uh, collapsed because of overfishing. And um, partly, not entirely, but in some small way, my fault, everybody started talking about overfishing. 
and overfishing is a, a problem sometimes. But you know, if you could find a fishery where the only problem was overfishing, that would be great. <laughs> There's just lots of other things going on. So if you look at Atlantic salmon, there isn't any overfishing of Atlantic salmon. There's barely any commercial fishing at all. And yet uh, the, the stock keeps declining every year. And you talk to uh, river managers in New England and Canada and Norway and Scotland, and, and, and they all tell you, you know, that the, the, the fish are spawning and the small ones, the smolts, go out to sea, and then far fewer of them come back than ever before. And so I asked a bunch of scientists at Woods Hole Laboratory in Massachusetts and some other places that were studying this, what's going on with the Atlantic? Why aren't the salmon coming back? And they also, it's climate change, it's, it's carbon. It's the, you know, carbon is very attractive to water. Something like a third of the carbon dioxide that goes in the air ends up in the ocean. And it changes the chemical makeup of the ocean. And zooplankton and capelin and these things that uh, salmon eat and also cod and other large fish are just not growing to the same size as they used to. So what's happening is that, um, the Atlantic is no longer producing enough food for the animals that live in it. This is, you know, 40 years of writing about environmental issues. This is the scariest thing I've ever learned. I mean, if the, if, if the ocean can no longer feed the fish, we are in very profound trouble. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think your book, Salmon, covered that extremely well, and I really enjoyed it. And am equally terrified. Yeah. Uh, uh, so we have another uh, question that came in uh, asking if you could fish any trout stream in the world, where would it be? If I can fish any trout stream in the world, where would it be? Um, well, You know, it's, 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 it's hard to make choices. It's like, what's your favorite kind of dog, you know? <laughs> um, what is your favorite, uh, you were talking uh, there's about? A, there's a, there's a street. West. I'm sorry? What were some of your favorite streams? You were saying that you tend to fish a lot out west. I was wondering. Yeah, in Idaho. I mean, I like the big wood, but there's also the, the um, there's, a, there's a little river off of it that uh, it's a wonderful river to fish because it's so clear that you just see the trout there and you see their big round eyes staring at you. And you realize that the only way you're gonna get them to fall for one of your flies is if you can get it in front of them without them seeing you do it. So it's literally about sneaking up on the fish. Yeah, you like the high stakes uh, stock fishing. Right, right. But, you know, um, so now there are very good waders, you know, and we all wade in the river. And uh, I, I, I love wading because you feel part of the river. But the truth is that it's often not the best way uh, to fish trout because they can see you. In the case of me, they see this big clumsy guy slipping on rocks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you'd often be better just fishing from the bank, uh, as, as fishers always used to do before the 20th century when they got good with waders. And in my book, I have an illustration, a 19th century illustration of a guy fishing from the bank. He's hiding behind a rock, he's hiding behind a rock and casting. Yeah, I love that illustration because it does seem like the technology sometimes advances us so far forward that we're actually not even as good at the thing. Right, right. I mean, it, it's, um, it's a hard thing to face because waiting is great. You know, you just the feel of the current against your legs and you just, you, you feel like you're in there with the fish and, uh, um, sometimes, of course, you have to if it's a big river and, and the, the, the 
pool or where you're casting is too far out to reach from the bank. But um, often you would be better off uh, from the bank. And I, uh, I sometimes, I caught an Atlantic salmon in Scotland from the bank. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, um, you know, everything in fly fishing is about assessing the situation. Um, but my instinct is to go into the river, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, yeah, it's kind of weird to think about fishing completely on dry land in waders and only stepping in when you need to. It's actually really occurred to me. Yeah, it's, it's actually a very smart, pragmatic way to fish, but it's, it's counterintuitive. It's against your emotions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for those who uh, are just joining us now or in the past few minutes, uh, we're chatting with Mark Kurlansky. Uh, he wrote a book on fly fishing that was recently released uh, it's called The Unreasonable Virtue of Fly Fishing, and there's a link in the chat uh, if you'd like to purchase that online through Magic City Books. Um, we have another question, uh, and I like this question. Uh, do you think there are situations where the fly angler has the upper hand, or situations where the fly angler has the upper hand to gear? Um. Well, I think as good as you get is an even chance. You know, <laughs> I don't know that you ever have the upper hand. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, I mean, some rivers have smarter fish than other rivers. Rivers where a lot of people fish, the fish tend to be smart. They've seen these phony feather things before. And you go to some, like this remote place I was talking about in Russia, and these fish, they don't know anything. They'll, they'll, they'll chase any weird little thing that's floating around because what do they know? <laughs> uh, uh, very different than if you're uh, fishing a river like the Baton Kill in Vermont or, you know, um, some of these famous rivers in America where, you know, I don't know, hundreds of people fish them. I, I'm, a, I'm a great fan of winter fishing. And there's a few reasons for that. But one is that nobody else likes it. So you have the river to yourself. Um, it's also, it's, 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 I, I like the scenery of the snowy banks. And <clears throat> out west in the Northern Rockies, you know, the, the, the uh, Northern uh, part of the mountains in the winter time doesn't have enough food. And so uh, the, the elk and the moose uh, and the wolves, all the wolves are so cagey, you never see them, but you do see the elks and the, and the moose, they, they come down to right where you're fishing to gather uh, food, willow buds or whatever, and uh, uh, that's great fun. Although it's kind of sobering, you know, moose, it's, like, it's kind of sobering to be fishing next to this animal that weighs 2,000 pounds. I mean, they're, they're just huge. Um, but better that than bears. <laughs> you know, a lot of people like fishing around grizzly bears. Um, me, not so much. However, I'd have to say that most of my experience fishing with grizzly bears, they haven't been aggressive. They're just, they're just standing there staring at you. And I, I, I swear, I think they're thinking, what is this guy doing? I mean, this is an animal who sticks his snout in the river and grabs a fish, you know? And what is this guy with the pole and the string and all that? What is he doing? <laughs> yeah, I was actually in grizzly territory last year uh, fishing in Montana and a guy, an angler had been uh, mauled two weeks earlier. And it's interesting when you have that information, you can go from feeling like, oh, yeah, we'll probably see a couple bears to almost feeling them around. No, I'm, 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 I'm very happy not to see bears. They, I've had friends who've been mauled. I mean, they're really powerful, dangerous animals. Uh, I was once up in Alaska and this friend was recommending different places to fish. And she told me about this one place that's really great. Because when you get a hit and you're trying to reel in the fish, the bear 
comes in after the fish. And I thought, I'm not doing that. Yeah, I don't need to do that either. <laughs> in, the, in the Kamchatka, the Russians have these dogs that they've trained. They're, they're sort of a cousin of sled dogs. They're called Laikas, these white dogs. And, and they just make a lot of noise and scare off the bears. Um, the bear could probably easily take them on. They're not that big, but they just make all this unpleasant noise and the bears run away. <clears throat> so, you know, I'm sitting around the camp and, you know, dogs, dogs always scope out the dog people, right? <laughs> right. So this, we got three Lycas and they're all hanging around with me because I'm the one who's patting them the most and rubbing their bellies and stuff. And we're all lying around having a good time. And a bear walks into the camp and the dogs are going like, Oh, could you scratch a little to the left, please? <laughs> and I say, hey, come on, guys. There's bears. Aren't you going to do up. something? And then finally, at the very last moment, they jump up, and one of them uh, bit the sow on her butt. And she went running off into the forest, and she kind of turns around with a look of indignation and rubs her butt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's amazing. That's amazing. We we need to get some of those dogs here for uh, fishing Montana. Yeah, yeah. No, the uh, uh, actually, I, I don't think you could do the Kamchatka without them. They they say it has the highest uh, percentage of grizzlies per land of any place in the world. Uh, wow. It's just, there's a lot of bears around. So they're just, you know, and they're all hanging out in the rivers fishing and uh, uh, especially the sows with their cubs, which is particularly bad because the worst thing you can do is get between a sow and a cub. And, um, you know, but they're just, most of them, they're just staring at you thinking you're weird. And, and they have cuckoo birds in the forest. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard a real live cuckoo bird, but they sound exactly like the clocks. <laughs> and so, you know, the bear is staring at you and you're hearing this cuckoo, cuckoo. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a wild experience. I mean, did you take the old military helicopters? Yes. And, yeah, and the these, old old, these old Soviet helicopters, they're, they're um, and there's, there's so, there's so many insects, uh, you know, you can barely breathe. There's, the, the, the insects are so thick and they're, uh, and they're in the helicopter. When you take off and you got to open the windows, get the insects out. Um, and they're just these huge, awkward things that use incredible amounts of uh, actually a fuel, you know, uh, from uh, from the uh, the only town, which is in the lower part of the peninsula, up to the wilderness where you fish. Uh, you have to stop part way to refuel because they just guzzle so much fuel, those things. And, and they would be so much better off uh, doing what they do in Alaska and just getting nice small planes. Um, but they have no airstrips and they have no planes and they have all these old helicopters. <laughs> Don't want them to go to waste, I guess. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's one of the, maybe even some of the draw to fishing there is you you encounter all of these unique aspects of fishing in a very particular place yeah yeah well there's something interesting i learned about this whole business with the with the insects you know the insects are just so thick and i was talking to this marine biologist and he had been in the u.s he had gone to some spot in the Columbia where they were trying to restore a Chinook run. And he said to me, I realized this is never gonna succeed. I said, why not? And he said, there weren't enough insects. And I realized that this whole thing with salmon and trout, these insectivore fish are supposed to be in this habitat that is stick with insects. We don't wanna be in a place that's thick with insects. And so we've, we've greatly reduced the insect population. In so doing, we've damaged the fish population. Yeah, I mean, that's some of the things you find on streams too, when they've created so much access, 
that it doesn't get the grasses or the foliage on right. the sides of the creek, but you don't have to roll cast and you can just walk right into the stream. Right. And we value that, but in turn, definitely lose some of the fish population. Yeah, I mean, need to take better care of riverbanks. Uh, there should, you know, people who, people who love, uh, people who are rich and love a beautiful river build a house on the bank. Bad, <laughs> you know, it's not good for the river. Um, and even, you know, like roads and even little hiking trails and stuff should be away from the bank. Uh, to try to interfere as little as possible with the insect life. Yeah, I agree. Um, I was wondering, for me, I can think back to a particular memory where uh, I no longer gear fished. Um, and then, you know, I think a year after that, I just didn't even own gear. Um, is it similar for you? The, have you completely converted to uh, fly fishing or is there still some? I guess I have, you know, I've, I, I've got my old surf casting rod in my closet, but I haven't taken it out in years and years. Um, uh, I, I really don't do, you know, every once in a while, if I'm by the sea, you know, and I have a friend with a boat who'll go out and bait fish or some striper or something, but, uh, um, most of the time now I just fly fish. It's, it's kind of inevitable. If you spend a lifetime fishing, you're gonna end up in one of two ways. It's actually Hemingway and his son. You either end up like Hemingway trying to catch the biggest marlin you've ever seen, or you end up like his son, Jack, who lived in Ketchum and, you know, he fish marlin with dad sometimes to please him, but all he really cared about was trout and salmon and uh, fly fishing became one of the world's great fly fishermen. And, you know, you, you end up gravitating that one way or the other. Yeah, so in Mark's book, he actually talks about Jack Hemingway parachuting behind enemy lines with a fly rod, which I thought, I, I never heard that. And, yeah, um, he, um, oh. you know, he was with the OSS, the forerunner of the CIA. Um, joining up with the French underground, uh, parachuting behind German lines. And he figured out a, a way to attach the fly rod with a, with a line so that it dang, you, couldn't, you couldn't jump holding it because you'd end up breaking it. He figured out a way that he could land without breaking the rod. <laughs> and you know, he, he went around with the French underground and uh, dealing with the Germans and all the while sort of scoping out rivers with good spots for fishing. I love that. Um, we have another question. Uh, somebody who is asking uh, how in a lot of your books, there's this line of environmentalism or sustainability. And she was kind of wanting you to speak to how you incorporate angling, eating fish, those kind of things with the understanding of, you know, some stocks being extremely low, super vulnerable, those kind of things. So it's a, it's a big question to unpack, but. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not sure exactly what they're asking about. Do I adjust my eating to the, the, the stocks or, I, I mean, I, most of my fishing is catch and release, but this is not, entirely environmental. It's sometimes environmental, but, but it's also the fact that um, I don't have a place to, to, to cook the fish. And to be honest, I'm not a big camper. I was a journalist. I was a foreign correspondent for many years. And because of different stories, I was doing wars and different things. I was often finding myself in situations where I was out somewhere camping. And um, I would never do that for fun. So, you know, when I'm through fishing, I'm, I'm, I'm all for going back to the lodge or wherever, and, you know, go to the bar and having a good drink and stuff. So I'm not going to be cooking the fish anyway. So uh, uh, <laughs> no, no point in taking it with me. Um, but, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, I wouldn't want to take the, you know, you don't want to take an Atlantic salmon. Um, it all, you know, kind of comes together in a natural way. It's a 
It's a funny sort of thing. I, I, this is my 34th book. I've got three more works in the works. We'll bring me up to 37. And when you've written that many books, you learn a lot about yourself. It doesn't start off as a self-learning uh, proposition, but you know, you just end up, you know, I look at these books and I look at the through lines in them and I, and I, and I see who I am. Um, and, you know, I never set out to be an environmentalist, but it's, you know, it's something that concerns me. Actually, even before I wrote books, when I was a journalist, I did a lot of environmental stories. And I, I always write about food. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by food. I'm fascinated by what people eat and how they eat it. I love recipes. I love um, recipes as artifacts, historic recipes, what they tell you about a people and a time. And, um, you know, all these things and a lot of themes that, you know, in odd sorts of ways, a lot of my books have similar themes and, and uh, none of this was planned. It just, you know, you write 37 books, you find out who you are. What, uh, in, in this newer book, uh, was, there, was there a discovery for you uh, about fly fishing? that you didn't know previously or something that fascinated you while you were writing about something that you do often? Well, yeah, a few things. I mean, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't realize how old it is, how far back it goes. Um, and, um, you know, to be a fly fisherman today, you need a lot of skills, but to be a fly fisherman in the 16th century, you really needed a lot of skills. I mean, you needed to be a blacksmith because you had to make your own hooks, you know, and then you had to decide how long the shank was and how deep the curve was. And you made your own line, um, usually from uh, horse hairs, so the horse tails. And, you know, so a, a line needs to be tapered. So you'd have maybe eight hairs on the rod end of the line, and then it would go down to five or four um, sometimes the, 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 the final stretch of the line, uh, what would be the leader, would be just one horse hair. I mean, can you imagine how good you'd have to be to land, say, a salmon with one horse hair? <laughs> Man, I complain already about tying up a leader set up, too, and that sounds terrible. Right? Yeah. Interesting. Uh, was there? They was didn't have to worry about the knots because they didn't have reels, so they didn't have rings. <laughs> that, I guess that helps some. That still just sounds daunting. Oh, it is, it, it, it is. And you know, today, what do we do? Well, we, we make our own flies and some people make their own rods. Um, but, uh, you know, it's nothing like uh, what it used to be. Everybody used to make their own rods. I have a friend who makes uh, split cane rods. They sell for about ten thousand dollars each. So he says to me one day, he says, "He says, Mark, you never fish with a cane rod. What are you too cheap?" <laughs> I said, "I said, look, you know how you got a big rainbow or a salmon, and you know you're 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 playing it, and you want to get the rod up as high as you can." And, you know, the tip is being doubled over, but you're, you, you, you don't want to straighten out the rod because then you won't get the right torque on the thing. And, and so you're dealing with this equation. When you're doing that, it's nice to know that the rod didn't cost you $10,000. <laughs> yeah, I can't, uh, the amount, of, I mean, I've probably lost three or four just going down rivers and, you know, hitting trees with tips, uh, you know, so many things can go wrong. Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah. the only rod I ever broke, a Russian guy tripped over. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, they're probably most dangerous when they're on the ground. Right. Um, there's another question that uh, if you, uh, I think it's saying if you had a favorite of your, uh, favorite of your books um or or if there were some that were harder to write 
you could speak to that. <clears throat> you know, the thing about writing books is that um, you don't have to do it. You know, you don't have to turn them in. So you don't turn them in until you've got exactly what you want. So I really like all of them because I never gave up on any of them. I just made them be exactly what I wanted. And um, which ones do I like best? I don't know. I, uh, you know, I have five books of fiction. I like the fiction a lot. I like writing fiction. Uh, three short story collections. I love writing stories because it's telling stories, you know, and that's what I do even with nonfiction. You know, I just, you can tell, I just love telling stories. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, my quirkiest book, uh, which is probably my least selling book, that's what you get, you know, if you try to be too original. <laughs> I have a, a book um, uh, called What? And the book is entirely written in the interrogative. It's about the importance of asking questions, and it's all questions. There's not one positive what? statement in it. It's all questions. <laughs> I, that's uh, one of one of few of yours that I haven't read. I'm gonna have to. Uh, I'm gonna. Have well, to hardly read. anybody has actually. But and the other thing about that book is that you know because I illustrate a lot of my books. I illustrated the fly book. Uh, it has some of the best illustrations I ever did. Okay, cool. Uh, we have another question, uh, and this person's wondering if you have any specific music that you like to listen to uh, on the way to the stream or on the way to a fishing trip. Well, I take that one step further. Uh, music that I think of in my head as I'm casting. And I basically have two ways of casting. I either cast to Bach. Uh, I love Bach. I play the cello. You know, I've been playing the same cello suite all my life and I'll never get it right. <laughs> but, um, you know, but Bach uh, was really about the intricacy of rhythm. Um, or the other thing is, uh, you know, Rock and roll is all 4-4 four, four time. And uh, so it works great for cast because casting is in 4-4 four, four time, if you think about it. Um, uh, Rolling Stones uh, can't get no satisfaction. Perfect for casting. <laughs> <laughs> I've never thought about uh, casting songs. That's, I might have to, uh, I might have to try that can't out. Can't get no satisfaction. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, and, and kind of uh, another, this is a question that I had as well. Um, you speak to a lot of the angler literature uh, in, in this new book. Do you have, uh, are, would you call some of those writers influence that influencers of you? Like, have you, uh, are any of those? Yeah. Uh, I mean, not so much, not so much the ones who write the sort of how-to-ish books, you know, Bergman and Trout and things like that. Um, but, uh, you know, certain, uh, I don't know if you know a writer named Haig Brown, who's a British writer who lives in British Columbia, wrote beautifully about fishing. And, um, and some of the fiction, I have a whole section in the book on fiction. Um, uh, one of my favorite books about fly fishing is called Green Rushes by Morris Walsh, Irish writer. Actually, a part of this book was used by John Ford for The Quiet Man, although, of course, you know, he completely changed it, and turned an Irish guy into an American guy and made him big because John Wayne was big and the whole point was that he was little, but he could box, you know. <laughs> and <clears throat> the, the, this book, is about an elite column of the IRA in Ireland during the Black and Tan War, 1920 to 1922. The brutal finale to the Irish independence struggle when Winston Churchill decided, you know, I'm gonna send some World War I veterans, their little 
slightly deranged and you know have them just beat up on these people and they they burned down towns and did all these atrocities and so you know it made the ira uh also become more violent and uh, so there's this group and they're they're fighting the british and you know if they get caught they get hanged they're doing all these things sometimes assassinations, kidnapping, sabotage, various things that are going around County Cork and other places in Southern Ireland. And, and as they're going along doing this stuff, they're checking out the rivers. They say, whoa, that's a good place. I'm going back there. <laughs> and, um, and at one point, uh, they receive orders to uh, assassinate uh, this British officer. So the British officer is coming around the bend and they've got him in his sights and they recognize him. He's a Scot who they used to fly fish with before the war. They can't shoot him. So they, 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 they take him and, uh, and they go fishing with him. And they just also, you know, the, 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 they know that the war isn't going to last much longer. There's negotiation. So they just you know, try to fly fish till the war ends, but it's not ending. And then one day they get orders to do some kind of a violent action and they're planning the whole thing. And then they realize this British officer is just standing right there while they're planning the whole thing. They say, oh, you can't tell anybody about this because it's a British officer. I, I can't be <laughs> quiet about this. They say, okay, so this is what we're going to do. And they take him to this remote place that has great fishing and they hold him there. So, of course, they can't hold him there alone. So they take turns holding him there, which is basically going fishing. <laughs> they all take turns fishing till the war <laughs> ends. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I actually have that book written down because when I was reading your book, uh, I, I've never come across that. I, I, yeah, it's called Green Rushes. Sometimes they call it the quiet man um, because you know, because of the film, but it, yeah. it's, um, uh, it's a, he was a wonderful writer, um, a favorite of Hemingway's actually. Okay, great. Jack Hemingway was in a bar in Ireland one day and there he was, Maurice Walsh. He goes up to him and says, you know, you were my father's favorite. And he says, really, how great, who's your father? <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that's awesome. Uh, well, uh, that's all the time we have. That went extremely fast. Yeah, uh, I did. Thanks so much uh, for taking the time. And uh, for everybody who's listening in, again, this is Mark Kurlansky, writer of a bunch of incredible books. Uh, most recently, The Unreasonable Virtue of Fly Fishing. Uh, there's several links in the chat. If you'd like to get that book from Magic City, you can buy it right now and it'll be delivered right away. If, um, if, if you are so kind as to buy this book, please do buy it from Magic City or, or some local bookstore, please. And uh, they need your support. And um, it's a beautiful book. You know, I did lots of illustrations. I did about a dozen drawings of flies and I did a dozen rivers and Bloomsbury did a great job putting it together. So it's a, um, it's a very attractive little book. Yeah. If you fly fish at all, or even if you don't, there's so many things to be had in this book and I can't recommend it enough. Uh, I'm probably going to read it again. I, really I, I you know, it's, it's, it's my hope that somebody who doesn't fly fish will read the book and then go out and fly fish. You know, that's, uh, that's what you like as a writer. I once I wrote a book on nonviolence, and somebody wrote me a letter. They were in the military, and they said they they read my book and they resigned their commission. And I thought, wow, you know, that's why you're a writer. <laughs> yeah, that's effective for sure. Uh, well, thank you so much again. I really enjoyed this, and thanks to Magic City for putting it together. And uh, yeah. Uh, in the link, uh, you'll find uh, Mark's new book and go buy it and let's make it a Oklahoma top 10, probably the first ever fly fishing book in an Oklahoma top 10 list. All right. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, thanks, have a great night. Thanks we'll a lot. Nice talking to you.